our uh, understanding of the person of God is woefully incomplete until we understand the, the depth and the breadth of the triunity uh, of God. You almost could imagine it as uh, three concentric circles that overlap at a certain point, and uh, it's a studied uh, totality of theology proper, Christology, and pneumatology, and understanding the fullness of God and the diversity of his personhood. Early this morning, I read a, a statement of faith from a well-known television preacher, which almost automatically makes him a poor theologian, not all but most, in which he described his belief in one God with three manifestations and went on to talk about the manifestation of the Father, manifestation of the Son, and manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's nothing but uh, old error in new dress, which through church history has been called modalism as a uh, rank heresy and false doctrine that in some eras would have uh, earned a theologian a burning at the stake because it is so far from the truth. I'm delighted we could have this uh, faculty lecture series on the subject of the triunity of God, Trinitarianism. In our first uh, lecture, we looked at the triunity of God in creation and discovered that all three persons, not manifestations, were involved in that. And then the triunity of God in the inspiration of Scripture and discovered the very same triune participation we saw in our last session together, session number three, as it relates to our salvation and sanctification, which really can't be uh, taken apart. It's uh, one unity uh, in two sections, maybe, or a progressive section, and the two words can be used interchangeably to talk about the whole or the parts. We discovered that our union in Christ involved the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This morning in our fourth session, uh, one uh, that doesn't have much biblical material uh, on a relative scale, is the triunity of God, Trinitarianism and eschatology, uh, the things that uh, yet lie ahead. And for that, we've asked uh, Dr. Vlock to uh, be our teacher, to be the instrument through which God teaches us this morning. So let's warmly welcome him as he comes. I will, I will. Enjoy this All right. Well, thank you, everyone. And Dr. Mayhew, thank, for this thank you for this opportunity to be involved with such a great topic. Uh, the Trinity and eschatology is not a great intersection of doctrines there. Uh, but as Dr. Mayhew has uh, stated, there hasn't always been a lot done on that particular area. Uh, I found that out as I was uh, doing some study on that, that if you, whether you do a Google search or search libraries or whatever, you type in, Trinity and eschatology, uh, there just uh, isn't a lot there as far as how people have written on it. But I will tell you what, there is a lot in the Word of God that needs to be there. So this has been um, a great treat to, to look into this issue. As a matter of fact, what I have in my notes before you is just a, a, a sampling, hopefully, of what will be a, a in the journal. I'm sure even that will be insufficient to some degree. So there is a lot uh, on this uh, topic. Uh, I was, uh, as I was studying, one writer you may be familiar with, John Walvert, is actually one who has written on this topic. And when he was writing on it, he said, there hasn't been a lot to go on in this area, but just two great topics. The Trinity, which is the, uh, the foundation and the creation source of all of reality and all, all the unity and diversity motifs that we see as far as mankind, with man being both male and female, and just... Um, all the diversity in the, in that takes place. It's just a wonderful topic. And then how that ties into eschatology. I mean, when you think of eschatology, you should be thinking of hope and the, the trinity that was so actively involved in creation, as we, we saw uh, in the messages with the trinity and the Old Testament. The trinity was involved with, with the creation. And of course, we know because of Genesis 3 that there has been a fall and that creation has been marred but your soul should be thrilled by knowing that the same trinity that was involved with creation is also involved with the coming restoration of all things. And as I've studied the scripture, I see all members of the trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit actively involved in restoring man, restoring the fallen creation. We look forward to a restoration of all things and a reconciliation of all things. 
That doesn't necessarily mean a salvation of all things, but the restoration and reconciliation of all things also includes God's dealing with those who uh, ultimately will not come to him. So I hope you enjoy uh, this message as I have enjoyed studying it. Uh, when I've studied the area of, of eschatology before, uh, oftentimes I've studied it by passage, like there's a major passage, Matthew 24, all of the discourse, or perhaps I've decided to study it by topic, like let's look at the tribulation, let's look at the millennium, let's look at the eternal state. But to look at it through the lens of the Trinity and to be asking questions about what are the members of the Trinity doing in regard to eschatology? What's the relationship between the members of the Trinity when it comes to eschatology? Uh, I found that study to be fascinating. So, as I mentioned our, on the sheet, our goal this morning is to examine how the members of the Trinity are involved in matters related to eschatology. So, I'm sure most of you know, but when we use the word eschatology, that's basically a fancy term for the study of last things. So, coming from eschatos, it's the last things. Eschatology is the study of last things. So, you may ref hear me refer to eschatology or to the eschatos, and I'm referring to those things that are to come. Now, the things that I'm going to focus on mostly in regard to eschatology are things that are still future from our standpoint. I do want to acknowledge that from the Old Testament perspective, there have been several things that have already come to pass in the sense of been realized. Obviously, Jesus, the Messiah's first coming, that was a fulfillment of prophecy. I think his session at the right hand of the Father that he has right now, that is a fulfillment of prophecy and of eschatology. I believe the new covenant ministry of the Holy Spirit that's taking place in lives of believers today, that's, that's related to eschatology. But just as there have been some things that have already come true with the first coming of Christ, there are also many things that are still to come from our standpoint. So those are the things that I'm going to be focused on mostly here, are those things that are future from our uh, current perspective. Now, when it comes to looking at the Trinity's role in eschatology, I, I was you know, thinking to myself, well, how, how do we approach this? Do we just go to certain passages or we try to look at it topically? And I decided to do a little bit of all of the above, actually. Uh, perhaps focusing mostly on the first couple of categories, but one way that you could do this when it comes to looking at the intersection of eschatology and the Trinity is to examine passages where members of the Trinity are explicitly present together. So where you'd see the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, or the Father and the Son, or the Father and the Holy Spirit, or the Son and the Holy Spirit. You could also, uh, number two, look at areas where the Father and the Son have primary roles in regard to eschatology. Like when it comes to the Davidic reign over the earth, uh, the Son has a particular role with that. When it comes to the, uh, the new covenant, the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in that regard with indwelling seems to be very prominent. And then thirdly, it's also possible to look at this issue in regard uh, to the roles of the Trinity by era. So you could take out like the tribulation period or the millennium or the eternal state or the judgments and say, what do the specific members of the Trinity you know, have to do uh, with those particular areas? So now I mentioned uh, at the bottom of page one that there's a setting of the context. I believe there's four parts to the Christian worldview and, and, and the, the Christian philosophy of history. There's creation, there's the fall, and that's where things went wrong, where God's very good creation became marred. There's the redemption that takes place in Christ, or what we could call the incarnation, where God's solution breaks forth into the world. And then there's a fourth part of the story, or the worldview, that I like to call the uh, restoration of all things. Uh, that is what is to come. That is eschatology from our standpoint. That is events that are following the second coming of Jesus. And I like to use Acts chapter 3, verse 21, where it talks about in connection with the return of Jesus Christ, there is going to be a restoration of all things in accordance with what the Old Testament prophets had predicted. It is also true, according to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 to 8, that this passage talks about that in the world to come, that the creation is going to be fully and finally subjected to man. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 to 8, will make reference back to Psalm 8, which is a, basically a commentary on Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. So God's involved with dealing with this fallen creation. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 to 28, Jesus ends up being the ultimate man. That is the one that is going to bring that to fruition because those of us apart from him are not able to do that, but he does it. So let's go ahead and look at the first category, shall we? Uh, the first category or section is going to be eschatological passages where members of the Trinity are explicitly present. Now just note here, I'm not going to all areas of Scripture where the Trinity happened to be, because if we did that, then we'd really, really have a long 
message, but, but those where it's in an eschatological setting. And even as I do these, I have to be very brief. We're, we're going to touch on a lot of passages to give you a broad survey, so I can't go into a whole lot of depth. But if you look in Revelation chapter 4, there's a heavenly throne scene and a plan to take the earth back for God. Uh, chapters 4 and 5, if you're familiar with Revelation, is this wonderful, glorious, beautiful, mind-boggling throne room scene with the glory of God. And you, that the God the Father is there, the Holy Spirit is there, the Lamb who is the Son who is there. And the setting of that scene is the setting for the take back of planet Earth. It's the scene where it's going to launch you into Revelation chapter 6 where the Lamb opens the first seal and the wrath of God is going to be poured out upon the world. But if you look in uh, Revelation chapter 4 verse 2, it says, Immediately I was in the Spirit. Now, some would say that actually is a reference to the Holy Spirit there. Others say, no, it's perhaps more just referring more to a spiritual sort of ecstatic trance that John is experiencing. But it says, immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And I think the, the context is pretty clear, though, that that's a reference to God the Father. He is the one that is on the throne. But I do think you see the Spirit for sure in verse 5, where it says that out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Most commentators believe that that reference to the seven spirits of God is actually a reference uh, to the Holy Spirit. Now, if that is the case, which I think, which I think uh, is the case, you actually have the presence of the Holy Spirit in this particular scene. So we've established that you have the Father and you have the Spirit. And if you would jump over to chapter 5, verses 5 to 7, you'll see all three of these together. Now, there ends up being this scene in chapter 5 where the question is being asked in verse 2, who is the one who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? The father has this book or this scroll in his right hand, which appears to be linked with the title deed of the earth. And who's going to be the one that can take back the earth from the wickedness and the wicked nations and all the rebellion that's taking place, including that of, of the coming Antichrist? And in verse 4, it says, I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. Now verse 5, And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping, behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and to break its seals. Just when things seemed seem bleak, and just when it seemed as if no one was worthy, the lamb appears, and that is the son. That is a reference to Jesus, uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the one who is worthy. He is the one that can take the book and open its seals. And then in verse 6 it says, And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders, a lamb standing as if slain. Again, another reference to Jesus the Son. As if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So again here you have that reference to the seven spirits of God, which again appears to be a reference to the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 7 it says, And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him, God the Father, who sat on the throne, and then this just launches into a worship scene. And so what you're seeing here in this very, very important segment here, this scene, which is going to lead to chapter 6 with the outbreaking of the wrath of God, we see all three members of the Trinity involved. They're all involved with the eschatological events that are going to be taking place here. As a matter of fact, if you look at chapter 6, verse 1, we see what the Lamb does. It says in chapter 6, verse 1, then I saw when the lamb broke one of the seven seals. And so he breaks the seals. And then if you look at verses 16 to 17, uh, these seals are unfolded, and you have these six seal judgments that take place, and you have a great earthquake. And notice the people on the earth, they understand that the Trinity is up to something here, because it says in verse 16, And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Now, in the immediate context there, it's referring, I think, to the Father and then the Son, you know, with the wrath of the Lamb there. But there you see, the, at least at this point, two members of the Trinity as they're involved actively with the pouring out of the tribulation judgments that are taking place at this particular time. So we see, in this particular context, the three members of the Trinity actively involved. Now, I want to draw your attention now, as, as we move on, that, that was actually one section where we saw all three members of the Trinity. And then later on, I'll point you to another one where you see it as well. But at this point, I want to start talking about some of the uh, relationship between the Father and the Son. 
And again, I have to be brief on some of these passages, but I want you to turn to Psalm 2. And this is a passage that Dr. Barrick referred to earlier, where he was uh, rightly showing uh, the connection here between uh, this Messiah and the, who is also God's Son from Psalm 2. I'm going to be taking you to Psalm 2 and then Psalm 110. But in Psalm 2, you have this statement in verse 1. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth, they take their stand and, and, the, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. And we'll see that this anointed is linked to the one who is the son according to verse 7. But, but, but basically they're in rebellion. Let us tear their fetters apart. Cast away their cords from us. So that's the rebellion. That's the rebellion of man. That's the rebellion of nations that is taking place. But notice what's going on in heaven at this time. Verse 4, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Man is being rebellious, but God is saying, I'm going to establish my king upon the earth. And that's one thing that we'll see in these passages that I'm referring to. One of the important aspects of eschatology in regard to the Trinity is that the Father is intent on having the Son rule over this earth for his glory. Verse 7 says, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my Son. So a specific reference there to this Messiah figure being the Son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. So it becomes very clear there that the Father's intent is to establish the King's Son upon the earth. And then when you, uh, I'm not going to read them, but if you read verses 10 to 12, there's a warning to the nations that you better kiss the Son. <laughs> you better do homage to the Son, which again shows that this Son is deity because no human being is called on to be uh, worshipped in such a way. But it tells us at the end of verse 12 that his wrath may soon be kindled. And as we saw in Revelation chapter 6, that wrath is released with the events of Revelation chapter 6. If you turn over to Psalm 110, we'll see this theme continue, that it is God the Father's intent to have his Son, the Messiah, the one we now know as Jesus, to rule the earth. Psalm 110.1 says, The Lord says to my Lord, David is privy to this conversation in heaven, Yahweh, the Lord says to my Lord, which is David's Lord, which is the Messiah. I, I think this is God the Father speaking to, to God the Son. And what does he say to him? Sit at my right hand. Well, sitting at the right hand, that's a position of authority in heaven. We, we saw that in Psalm 2. He who sits in the heavens laughs. But sit at my right hand until, notice that there's a time indicator there, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And then in verse 2, this is what happens after, after that session at the right hand of the Father. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. And so just like Psalm 2, there ends up being the Messiah who, because of the Father's authority, comes to the earth and he begins his rule. And it says in verse 5, the Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. So when he comes, he is coming to judge the nations and even to do so violently with those who are his enemies. So just like Psalm 2, we see another passage here. The Father delegating to the Son that he wants him to rule. Now this leads us to a passage that I find very enlightening and very interesting. As a matter of fact, I would say of all the passages that have really been on my mind the last month, this one would probably be number one. And it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 to 28 because it's actually giving you the reason why the Father, the first person of the Trinity, wants the second person of the Trinity, the Son, to rule. You're given an explanation here. Now, verses 24 to 28 is coming after the order of the resurrection program, which is discussed in verses 20 to 24. So I don't have time to go through this three-staged resurrection program that's discussed here. I do think that in verse 24, when it talks about then comes the end, I think that's after the third stage of the resurrection program. So with my understanding of things, I think that is after the millennial kingdom of Christ of a thousand years. But what I want you to notice is the son's role in regard to what the father wants. Verse 24 says, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom 
to the God and the Father when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. So when this time period of the end comes, we see here that he, the Son, Jesus, the King, hands over the kingdom to the God and Father. You know, it's a beautiful picture there. He rules, and when he has reigned over his enemies, he hands the kingdom over. But it only occurs when he has abolished all rule and all authority and all power. And I think that will be fulfilled during the millennial kingdom of Christ. Verse 25 says, For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. So one thing that's important here is the Messiah has to reign, and he has to reign over all and put any sort of rebellion down, which I think connects with Psalm 2, also connects with what Psalm 110, verses 2 and following talked about it. Now we're told in verse 26 that the last enemy that will be abolished is death. And so death is the final one that is dealt with. And then verse 27 tells us, for he has put all things in subjection under his feet. Again, that's a reference back to Psalm 8, which again is a commentary on Genesis 1, 26 to 28, which indicates that the creation was first given to man to rule and subdue. He has failed. He is failing now. But Jesus is going to be the one that fulfills that rule. So he will put all things in subjection under his feet. Now there's a little bit of qualification going on here because in the next part of verse 27 it says, but when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. So Paul makes a little qualification here. As the son is ruling and reigning and putting down all rebellion and getting everything perfectly in order, the father is the one who is an exception to that in a sense because he doesn't need to be subjected. He's the one that has granted the son the authority to do the kingdom reign. So he makes that point there that you know, the father would be the one exception to that because he's the one delegating the authority to his son and his king. And then in verse 28, I just find this really, a, a really a beautiful and insightful verse. Verse 28 says, when all things are subjected to him, in other words, when the, when the king and the Messiah has reigned and put all his enemies underneath him, then the son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him. This picture here, it's almost like a Roman emperor who has a, a trusted general that he sends out to put down a rebellion. He basically tells his general, there's a rebellion out here. Things aren't going right. Fix it. <laughs> I'm going to give you my authority. I'm going to give you the military. I'm going to give you the, all the emblems of authority. Go out and do it and do it on behalf of me and do it on, on behalf of the empire. And when this general does that, he comes back. And he doesn't come back to be at war with the emperor, but he comes back and says, mission accomplished. And he does everything according to the leader. That is similar to what is taking place here. God has sent the father, the father has sent the son on a mission to fix the broken planet and to fix things that have been marred and to reign over all areas. And when he does... He comes back to the Father. As it says, he will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him. So that God may be all in all. I think that means that every square inch of the universe is brought back into perfect conformity. Perfect conformity with the way that things were supposed to be. It's kind of like in uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Remember when Jesus told his disciples to pray? You know, to pray that, you know, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's implied that in this fallen world, obviously God is in sovereign control of all things, but there's still rebellion. There are still negative things that are taking place. We're to pray that God's will on earth will be done as it is in heaven. Well, guess what? At this point, it perfectly is. God is all in all, and everything has been conquered by the Messiah, by the Son, as he comes back to the Father and is subject himself to the Father. So I think that's a real, when you look at those three passages, in particular that 1 Corinthians 15, that for me puts that understanding between the Father and the Son, it helps me with that dimension of that, that the, father, that the Son is the trusted one, the warrior, the king, who fulfills what the, what the Father has him to do, and he does it successfully, so that the Father may be all in all. All right, so that's the Father and the Son. Now let's move on now to the Father and the Holy Spirit. So we're still within that first category of looking at the relationships between the members of the Trinity. 
And there's the Father and the Holy Spirit. And with the, with the passages that I have mentioned there, I think one thing that you see is that the Old Testament makes clear that the Lord, that Yahweh, is involved with the new covenant that will be coming and what that means for his people, which would also include the people of Israel. Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36 is talking about Israel has been dispersed to the nations because of their sin and because of their unbelief and their disobedience. But because God is covenantally faithful and he's made promises to this specific people group, he's going to fulfill what he promised. And notice how this involves the Holy Spirit. Verse 24. Ezekiel 36, 24 says, For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Now notice verse 27. I will put my spirit within you. This is a new covenant passage. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe all my ordinances and you will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers so you will be my people and I will be your God. The Mosaic covenant that was given to Israel was a good and holy covenant, but it didn't enable. It didn't give internal enablement for those to keep it. But the new covenant does because the Father promises that he is going to be giving his spirit within people to cause them to obey him. And in this particular passage, this has direct relevance to the nation Israel. Now, as I mentioned before, I do think there are partial fulfillments of some things, and I do believe that we as believers, according to Acts 2, also have the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. But it's also going to be true, too, that Israel is going to receive that at the time of the second coming. Uh, you don't need to turn there, but in Romans chapter 11, verses 26 to 27, it talks about the fact that all Israel will be saved. And then Paul ends up quoting, which is my second passage there, Isaiah 59, verses 20 to 21, which is a new covenant passage talking about the Holy Spirit being with Israel uh, in, in the end times. Joel chapter 2. Let's go ahead and look at that passage in Joel 2. Joel is a, in chapter 2 is talking about the day of the Lord. Uh, Joel chapter 2 verse uh, 11, I believe, uh, makes reference to the day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome. But I want you to notice verse 28. It says that it will come about after this. I'm in verse 28 of Joel 2. It will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind or all flesh. And your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions, even on the male and the female servants. I will pour out my spirit in those days. So again, we see another new covenant passage here, which indicates the role of the, role of the, of the Father and the Spirit in this regard. Now moving on to the next one here, the Son and the Holy Spirit. For this, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 3. I actually debated how to categorize Matthew 3 because I almost put it in the category where you see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together because it is true at the end of this section in, in Matthew 3 that you see the presence of the, uh, of the Father as well. But if you look in Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist has been preaching the message of the nearness of the kingdom of heaven according to Matthew 3, 2. But then when you, when you look at verse I'll actually start in verse 10. Matthew 3, 10 says, John the Baptist says, The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I. And I think he's referring to Jesus there. And I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And there you see the intersection of Jesus now with the new covenant. Because we see that he is going to be the one who is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So I think that has implications for the new covenant there. He's going to be the agent in regard to the baptism, baptism with the Holy Spirit. And then it mentions, and with fire. And I think that fire contextually, based on verse 10 and verse 12, is referring to judgment fire. I think it has even implications for day of the Lord judgment that will eventually come. So here you see that this, this Jesus, this is the one who is coming. He's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. 
And this involves the new covenant ministry of the Holy Spirit. It involves a judgment of fire for those who don't believe. So you see those two members of the Trinity that are involved there. And then as I mentioned before, if you jump down to verses 16 to 17, you do see all the members of the Trinity here in verse 16. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So you have the Son there. You have the Father with his declaration. You have the Spirit of God descending as a dove, the end of verse 16. So in this particular passage, which I think has implications for the new covenant and the day of the Lord, you see all the members of the Trinity uh, that are involved. Now I mentioned some other passages there. I mean, if you were to read John 16, uh, particularly verses 7 to 8, uh, it's very clear that Jesus' departure means the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so you can read that and see that there. So that's an important uh, part of the relationship between the Son and the Holy Spirit. But I would like to do now is move on to my second category as we look at our survey here. The second category of way of evaluating the Trinity in regard to eschatology would look at the primary roles that the members of the Trinity have. And I use the word primary because I don't want to use the word exclusively because part of the beauty and the mystery of the Trinity is there may be certain activities that, that are mostly true for one of the members, but other members are also involved as well. Even like with the resurrection, particularly of Christ. It, you know, it says that the Father raises him up, and Jesus says, I have the ability to take, take up my own life. According to Romans 8.11, the Holy Spirit is involved with the resurrection as well. So sometimes you can see some interlap in their roles. But what I try to do here is summarize, make some general statements here based on my understanding of the passages where primary roles would be evident. So when it comes to the Father, I would say, number one, the Father's goal or purpose is to make sure creation is restored for his glory. Enemies are crushed and servants are rewarded and empowered to carry out their dominion mandate, which I would say is taking place with, with the second coming of Christ. Revelation chapter 2, verses 26 to 27 indicate, Jesus says that when he comes again, he's going to grant Psalm 2 authority over the nations and ruling with a rod of iron to those who have been faithful uh, during this uh, present church age that we live in. Secondly, I would say another role of the Father is the placing of the Messiah and his kingdom. Wasn't that very clear in Psalm 2 and Psalm 110? God says, I will establish my king on Mount Zion. He will rule the nations. He will stamp out evil. Number three, I had to include this as well with the Father. The timing of eschatological events. Remember in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 with the Olivet Discourse? Jesus is discussing the details of the sign of his coming and of the end of the age. And what does he say in verse 36? But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. So at least at that particular point in his earthly ministry, the timing of these events, the special prerogative of the Father. That does not mean less in essence than the Father. But when it comes to function, there ends up being some difference in some of these areas. Also in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 7, this is when Jesus is getting ready to ascend into heaven. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or epochs by which the Father has fixed by his own authority. In other words, that, that's not for you to know. That is specifically uh, in the realm of the Father. 2 Peter 3.10 talks about the day of the Lord coming like a thief. Now that may not just be limited just to the Father, but clearly that aspect of that there's going to be a surprise element to the events of eschatology. Next, what about the son's role? What is the son's role in regard to eschatology? I believe, number one, based on the passages that we've looked at, that the son's role is to be the one who restores the fallen creation to the father. He is the one who restores all things. Secondly, he's the first fruits of the resurrection. I do want you to turn to this one. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which is discussing the resurrection program and the, and the stages of the resurrection. It, it tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. His resurrection body is the prototype. It's, it's the first fruits. 
what God has done for Jesus, he's going to do for those who are also in Jesus. So he's the first fruits of the resurrection. It's also true that the son, number three, is involved with the Davidic reign. If you were to read Luke chapter 1, verses 32 to 33, that's what the angel tells Mary, that this coming son that she's going to have is going to rule over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, Jesus says that when he comes with his angels in all his glory, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Then all the nations will be brought before him for judgment. Then the kingdom will come. Also, number four, the son is involved with handing the kingdom over to the father. We saw that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 to 28. We also saw in that passage that the son will be subjected to God the father. And it's also true based on passages like John 5, 26 to 29 and Matthew 25, 31 to 46, that judgment has been given to the son. So major aspects of the son's role in regard to eschatology. What about the Holy Spirit's role in regard to eschatology? Well, I think based on the, some of the passages that we've looked at, number one, the Holy Spirit's role is to empower the saints in their relationship with God, which is the new covenant ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's indwelling and the new covenant allows an internal conformity to the will of God and a joyful acceptance of what God requires. Number two, I would say John 14 verse 17 indicates the shift from abiding to being in. He is with you, but he will be in you. The indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit there. Romans chapter 8 verse 11. I, may, I, I will have you look at this one. In Romans chapter 8 verse 11. This is talking about the resurrection. The passage states, But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. We actually could have included that passage in one of those where you see all three members of the Trinity in an eschatological event dealing with the resurrection. You're seeing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, in, in that particular context. I think it's, all, it's also true based on uh, Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, that the Holy Spirit is involved with the call to salvation in light of the end times and eschatological events that will take place. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17 says, says, the Spirit and the bride say, come. And let one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. So you see the Holy Spirit's role in calling people to belief in light of the uh, events that are to come. That leads us now to our third category. I told you we were going to do these in a survey fashion. But the third way to look at the relationship of the Trinity in regard to eschatology is to look at the Trinity's role in eschatology by era. We've looked at the relationships within the Trinity. And then we looked at the various roles that the members of the Trinity have. But what about according to era? Now, obviously, this has to be very brief and very survey-like, but let me summarize some things I think about the Trinity's role in eschatology by era. I do include the present in this one, by the way. Like I said, most of my discussion has been on the future. But in regard to the present, I, I see the Father in sovereign control of all things. He is working all things according to the counsel of his will. 2 Peter chapter 3 also indicates that he is patient before the day of the Lord, not wishing that any should perish, but that there would be repentance on the part of people. I think when it comes to present eschatology, the Son has come as the suffering servant. Isaiah 53 has been fulfilled. According to Acts chapter 2, he's also been exalted as Messiah to the right hand of the Father. And he's also been involved with the sending of the Spirit. When it comes to the Holy Spirit's role in this particular age, I see him involved with the new covenant ministry of the Holy Spirit, which includes indwelling. There are many aspects of the new covenant that are still to come, if you were to read Jeremiah 31 to 33, but the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, that is taking place. When it comes to the rapture of the church, if you were to read about the rapture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, and if you read, were to read the purposes of that event according to 1 Thessalonians 1, 10 and 5, 9, Jesus rescues the church from the wrath to come. 
So one of the roles of the Son is going to be is that when the tribulation breaks forth, the church will be rescued from that event. When it comes to the Bema Seat judgment that is talked about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, it talks about Christians being before the judgment seat or the Bema Seat of Christ, where what they've done is being evaluated. When it comes to the tribulation period, we saw in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, that there's the wrath of the Lamb. And we saw in, in verse 17 of chapter 6 as well that it also involves the wrath of the one on the throne. So both the Father and the Son are involved in the, in the wrath that is occurring during that tribulation period. When it comes to the role of the Holy Spirit, we do have to look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I actually should have included this within the section dealing with the relationship between the Son and the Holy Spirit because I do think that you find both here. Now there's a little debate on the restrainer that's talked about in this passage, but I, I do think it's a reference to the Holy Spirit. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, Paul says, you know, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come, referring to the day of the Lord, unless the apostasy comes first. Then he refers to that man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes a seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. And then in verse 7, Paul says, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed. Now there's a lot of debate there on the whole issue of who the restrainer is. I do think it's a reference to the, to the uh, restraining ministry of the Holy Spirit. And if that ends up being the case, that would be a reference to the Holy Spirit. But notice the sons mentioned right after that. Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan with all power and signs and false wonders. So that would be another passage where you see you have the restraining ministry of the Holy Spirit. That is removed. I still think the Holy Spirit is involved with saving people and regenerating them. So it doesn't mean that he has absolutely no role in the tribulation. But his restraining influence is removed. The lawless one is revealed. But that is one whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth when he comes again. Which actually, when I think about 2 Thessalonians 2, it, it makes me think that I probably should have added another category in these notes, which would be the Trinity's involvement with the slaying of the false trinity. There you have, if you were to read Revelation 12 and 13, you get the false trinity. You get Satan, the dragon, you get the beast, and you get the false prophet. If you were to read the last verses of Revelation 19, verses 20 to 21, and then rolling into the first three verses of Revelation 20, what do you see? When Jesus comes again, the beast and the false prophet are dealt with, and then Satan is bound and thrown into the abyss. So the Trinity is also involved with the destruction of the members of the false trinity. I mentioned also under the category of the second coming that when Jesus returns to earth, he assumes the Davidic throne, Matthew 25, 31. According to Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46, Jesus judges the nations to see who enters the kingdom that is established at that time. During the millennium, there's much there about the reign of the Son. You have the Davidic reign, reign of Jesus the Messiah occurring over Israel and the nations. Read Zechariah 14. You'll see that when the, when the Messiah returns to the Mount of Olives, he's going to have a kingdom reign headquartered in Jerusalem, but also over all the nations. He's also granting authority to all those who believe in him. Revelation 2, verses 26 to 27. Holy Spirit's role? I think the Holy Spirit's role in the millennium will be continue to be new covenant ministry. We know that he's still involved with saving people and indwelling people. We know that's true for Israel as discussed in Ezekiel chapter 36. And then when it comes to the eternal state, we already saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Jesus hands the kingdom over to God the Father. And then he is subjected to the Father so that the Father can be all in all. But if you turn to Revelation chapter 22, there's this beautiful scene. In Revelation chapter 22, it says, 
you know, in verse 1, that he showed me a river of the water of life. And this is a description of the new Jerusalem that's on the new earth. He showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So notice, it's from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So even in the eternal state there, you explicitly are seeing the, two, the first two members of the Trinity. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bond servants will serve him, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And they will no longer be any, there will no longer be any night. They will not have need of the light of a lamp nor the light of a sun because the Lord God will illumine them and they will reign forever and ever. Now when it comes to the eternal state, it's hard to picture exactly what that will be like. But here we see explicitly, you see there's God the Father, there's the Lamb. It doesn't explicitly mention the Holy Spirit, but I'm assuming his indwelling ministry and his enabling and the relationship dynamic that's what involved with him is, is fully there as well. But one thing you do see is that for the first time since before the fall, the presence of God fully dwelling with men. So I don't know how that's going to look like, but when we get to this spot on the new earth with the new Jerusalem, the Godhead, the one God that exists in three persons is fully dwelling with man. That has not been seen since the events of uh, Genesis 2. So as we look at those areas, I hope these, this survey, which is very broad, has stimulated your this interest to look into these areas. Again, remember, the study of eschatology is to give us hope. And as we look at how the Trinity intersects with the doctrine of eschatology, I think it should thrill our hearts because we see all three members of the Trinity, the three members of the Trinity that were involved at creation, who created us, are actively involved in the restoration of all things so that on the new earth, we are going to enjoy the full presence of God, something that we can't even fathom and will be more wonderful than we can think. Hopefully that excites your soul. It excites mine. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for uh, the chance to survey passages pertaining to the end. Lord, there's so much here and our understanding is so limited but I just pray that these would be messages of, of hope for us and that we know that in a fallen world that we live in, that things aren't just going to continue as they are. Evil and sin and rebellion and all these things contrary to you will not go on forever. You, you will restore all things and we look forward to that day for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.